going to invite you to stand with us as we call people in for worship this morning. Well, good morning and welcome to Oak Street this morning. So happy to see so many faces out there. Glad that you chose to join us this morning, whether you're joining us in person, uh, we're grateful for you, or if you're joining us online on Facebook or uh, on Oak Street, or if you're uh, joining us on the radio at Y100 FM, we are grateful that you're here this morning and chosen to worship with Oak Street. Uh, I want to. I'm excited about this morning's services, both of the services. 
Uh, we've got a special guest with us this morning, uh, Brother Rick Dayton, who's going to be preaching. Um, and he is a, uh, uh, used to be an atheist, now is, uh, or used to be an agnostic. Which one? Atheist? Atheist, atheist and is now a, uh, a creationist um, and an apologist uh, for, the, uh, for the kingdom. And so we're excited to hear from you this morning, Brother Rick. All right, I have a couple of announcements real quick this morning. Uh, first of all, what are you guys telling me back there? Oh, yeah, sit down. It's like they're swimming back there. I don't, I don't know what that means. Yeah, y'all can sit down. You don't have to stand up and listen to me. All right. Um, <laughs> A couple of quick announcements. First of all, if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we would love to know that you were here. And so if you'll look at the back of the seat in front of you, there's a, there's a little pamphlet there. And on that pamphlet, there's a tear-off section. If you will just fill that out, leave it in one of the offering boxes on your way out this morning, that's your gift to us. Or if you'll let us know this morning that you're watching on Facebook, uh, just make a comment there in the comment section. And uh, we would love to know that you're here. All right, I've got a lot of announcements to run through. Break out your bulletin. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. First of all, our Wednesday evening activities are up and running. Uh, so Wednesday nights, we've got Bible study over here for the adults, uh, men's and women's, and uh, prayer meeting. And then across the street, we've got students uh, midweek for our, uh, for our junior high and high schoolers. And then we've got Camp Fit for our kids. And Pastor Joe is leading that. And so... Uh, that's exciting times on Wednesday nights. I need to let you know that um, this Wednesday is the end of our annual used book sale. So if you haven't checked out the books in the foyer yet, uh, please take a, a, a few minutes this afternoon and do that. Um, there's some great books out there that you can get uh, at a great price, and it supports uh, the Oak Street Library. Um, men's breakfast. Oh, sorry. Painters. I forgot about painters. We need painters this Saturday, July 25th, from 8 a.m. to noon. Uh, we're going to give our kids' classrooms a fresh new look. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm excited about Open Door this year. You may have heard that Open Door uh, has already exceeded our goal for, uh, for registration, and registration is still open if you want your kid to go to Open Door. So uh, we're excited about that. We need a couple of teachers. Uh, but we're going to beautify our building over there for this coming school year. So if you can paint, please come by at uh, 8 o'clock next Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to noon. Men's breakfast next Sunday, uh, so be prepared for that. Uh, griddles in the coffee pot start up at 6.30. Serving starts at 7.30. There's a uh, kind of a short devo to kick off the day. So men, bring your sons and grandsons and uh, join us for that. And then uh, next Sunday night, we're going to have a solemn assembly. Uh, we, if, if our nation has ever needed Jesus, we need Jesus now. And, uh, man, what an incredible thing for God's people to come together and pray for revival and repentance. And so join us at 6 p.m. next Sunday night for that. Promise Keepers, uh, just a couple of weeks away. Uh, so men, put that on your calendar, uh, July 31st and August 1st. It'll start uh, Friday evening and go into Saturday morning. Cost is $25. You can register online. You can talk to Willie over there if you have questions about it. Bible in 90 Days uh, is coming next month. Judy Hutto, we're excited about that. She leads that in the usually in the spring and in the fall. And uh, so this is going to be the fall session. Uh, it's just great to get a, an overview of the scripture and um, our safety and security team is in need of a few volunteers. If you're interested in helping out with that, please contact Pastor Lowell in the church office and uh, he can get you hooked up uh, helping out with our safety and security team. And then the last thing I want to mention is, of course, our church app. I'm excited about our church app. A lot of people have downloaded it. I've seen that there's uh, there's been over 100 downloads of our church app. So I'm excited to see that you're using it. One of the most unused features of the church app, I'm going to encourage you to use it, is the prayer wall. Um, so we've got a little tear-off section in our bulletin right here this morning. If you have a special prayer need, our staff loves, loves, loves to pray with you. Um, and so we take these, you fill these out, leave them in, in the offering boxes, and we take these and we pray over them. Um, but one of the most unused features of the church app is the prayer wall. 
And uh, so if you go to the prayer wall, many of you may not have noticed, but up in the upper right-hand corner, there's an add button. So you can put your prayer requests there on the prayer wall. Other people can commit to pray with you. And so I hope that you will take an opportunity to do that. If you haven't downloaded the app, um, you should do that because it's great. All right. I'm going to throw it over to the Beamans for scripture and prayer this morning. Thank you, buddy. I'm Frank, and this is Terry. Um, scripture, excuse me, the wisdom glasses. Um, scripture this morning is real dear, near and dear to our hearts as a family of musicians. Um, this really touches us. Psalm 33, 1 through 8. Uh, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host. By the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Please pray with me. Oh, Father God, we come before you so humbly this morning and so grateful that we can be here together. Lord, you know that every person in this room has something going on, Lord, and you are not oblivious to those details of our life. You are right with us, and you see us, God, and we thank you. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness. Lord, we praise you that you are the God of creation, and if you have created all this, surely you can work in our lives. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day and for this worship service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you guys will stand with us and join us in worship this morning. Just 
so alive. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so So It's yo 
in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give Father, we come to you right now. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to hear uh, the word uh, from a man who's uh, going to bring it a different way than we're, we're used to. Lord, a treat for us today. Lord, I pray for uh, Pastor uh, Brother Rick as he comes and uh, shares your word today. We thank you that you, you brought him to us. Lord, we give this time to you and we worship you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Calling up Rick. I want to introduce you, Rick Dayton. He, uh, 
the way we got to know Rick was through Tamara Roy. Uh, Tamara spent about five or six years, I think, translating for Rick in Ukraine. Seven, I think, yeah. Seven years in Ukraine. So uh, that's how we got to know him. He came to visit them, and they invited him to come to my class last year. And I said, we got to get him in front of the congregation. So I just want to introduce you to Rick Dayton. Thank you. And thank you. It's a privilege to be here. And we had a little song fest last evening in Wade and Tamara's backyard. And uh, so this, this is even a great amplification of that. And so I love the music. Uh, Chris, I need to have you send that to our home congregation. But um, maybe they can tune in. Also, remind me of the brother who read scripture? Frank? Frank, I want to go one more verse beyond what you read in Psalm 8, because verse 9 says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You know, I've heard even Christians say, well, it doesn't tell us how he did it. It tells us, yes, it tells us when he did it, in the beginning, and it does tell us how. He spoke it into existence. And you know what? You've just sung a, a big share of what I had to say for my message. So I just pray for me to just put the icing on the cake. And so here's the thing. When authority speaks, things happen. Any military individual knows that is true. When the general speaks, things better happen fast. And when the general, the king of the universe, spoke, he spoke the elements into existence. It does tell us how. It's just, are we going to believe him or not? Well, I want to just give you a little bit more background. But first, I want to um, mention about the display out here. What's on the, that square table? Everything there is free to you on two conditions. If you take it, you read it, or you watch it, and then you share it with somebody. There's a, a can for overseas outreach, and if the Holy Spirit motivates you, you want to put something in that, that's fine. It'll be an offering for overseas outreach, and it's through our overseas outreach ministry that I got acquainted with Tamara, and I found out that Loyal had already been going there before I ended up going to Nikolaev, um, but... A few items on that round table, those are for display only. You can just look through those things. But anyway, if you want to put something in the can, there, that's fine. But there is no obligation. You can take what you, you want. By the way, if you want to take extras to pass on for friends and relatives, feel free to do so. I don't want to take all that heavy stuff back with me on the airplane. But um, that's, not, that's not the real reason. Now... I want to also bring as an introduction to my own message both of these messages and why I believe in God and why creation matters is a, a, an underlying issue we need to deal with. Have you heard that we're living in the post-truth generation? Post-truth, what does that mean? Does that mean that truth doesn't matter? I mean, we're definitely seeing a lot of distortion of truth going on in our media, our higher education, and all, all this, but a post-truth culture. So um, actually, it's nothing really new because um, back in the 1940s, C.S. Lewis was already writing about this. You know, the idea that all truth is relative. Have you heard that statement? All truth is relative? Well, let me ask you a question. Is that absolutely true or is it relatively true? <laughs> you see, it's an absolute statement that all truth is relative. It is self-contradictory. C.S. Lewis pointed out, if somebody says all truth is relative, put him to the test. I mean, this is a, just a paraphrase, but he said, try stealing his orange. And he, if he says, well, if, no, you can't do that, that's wrong. You can say, well, that's your truth. My truth is this is my orange. Just see what kind of reaction you get. You see, it's very hard for people to be consistent. In fact, it's impossible to be consistent and say that all truth is relative. And there's a flip side. 
Have you ever heard the flip side? Um, there is no absolute truth. You can ask somebody, are you absolutely sure of that? Because that's also an absolute statement, that there is no absolute truth. So um, if it's only relatively true, then it's not true at all. And so this, there's something basically wrong with all of this. You know what it is? It breaks the law of non-contradiction. Now, there's a whole lot of things that people claim are contradictions in the Bible, and they are not contradictions at all because people who claim there are contradictions in the Bible, you just ask them, can you show me one? And normally they have no idea about the context because you can take something that people say, if you, take, if you pluck something from here and something from there out of the context, you can make almost anybody sound self-contradictory, right? And besides that, we're human beings. Actually, we are self-contradictory, and, and a big part of the refining process that God's working on us is to bring us into harmony with the truth. So if it's really true, it will be logically consistent. So how is it that you can test truth? So I think there are, true, uh, there are three obvious tests that you can recognize if it's true. If it is logically consistent, and logically consistent means you need to look at it in the big picture, is it consistent with itself, not taken out of context? Is it verifiable? There are a whole lot of statements that evolutionists make, and when you research them, they may sound feasible on the, on the surface, but when you re research them, they are not verifiable. I mean, there are guys who go around, there are evolutionists who say evolution is a fact. Ask for the definition of, it, of evolution because it's like a sliding scale. There are various definitions of evolution. So what, what usually they're talking about is Darwinian evolution that from molecules to man, it just happened. If you give it enough time, it's going to happen. So time and chance work the miracles in evolutionism. But when you really check it out, is it verifiable? And I've checked it out for most of my life. No, it is not verifiable, except it's verifiably wrong, and there's a whole string of hoaxes that go along with it. Another one is, is it practical? And, and you know, there's, um, well, there, any of these can be taken to extremes. But when I say, is it practical? Something may sound feasible, but think of this. There's a, one of the Greek philosophers. I've even forgotten his name, but I remembered from my philosophy class. When I took philosophy at, uh, class at Ozark Bible College, after studying the Word of God intensely for four years, it came across, and this is supposed to be great wisdom, the great wisdom of the Greeks. Well, one of the Greek philosophers came up with the idea that it's impossible for anything to move. You ever heard that? Well, here's his logic. If it moves where it is, it hasn't moved. If it moves where it isn't, it can't be there. So therefore, it's impossible for anything to move. Well, one time when he was haranguing a crowd, he got so worked up that he threw a, so a shoulder out of joint, out of location, and so he went to a doctor, it was sort of a chiropractic type doctor, and wanted to have his shoulder fixed. Well, it so happened that this doctor had heard him. So he said, well, just a moment here. If your shoulder moved where it is, it hasn't moved. And if it moved where it isn't, it can't be there. Get out of my office. <laughs> His, his philosophy was not practical. At that point, he abandoned his philosophy and said, I don't care how it got there, fix it. Okay? So that's another test for truth. Well, I, can, I came to tell you why I believe in God, and I'm going to give you very, three basic reasons. Now, in the next session, why creation matters, you've got a detailed outline. You don't have a detailed outline here, but I'm going to give you a very brief one. You can use this. Creation... Um, is reasonable. But here's, here's the three reasons why, why I believe in God. Number one, 
reason. Two, resurrection. Number three, relationship. Reason, resurrection, relationship. Those are the three reasons why I believe in God. We sang about this first one because when you see the creation of God all around us, you know he exists. In fact, do you know that the scripture declares through the Apostle Paul that every human being on the face of the earth knows God exists? Yeah. It's ingrained within us. Small children on up. And so if you've been concerned about what about the hot and tot in Africa that's never heard the gospel, well, realize this too. God judges on the basis of what you do with the light you're given. There is the light of his creation. Every human being not only knows God exists, but every human being knows Jesus in a vague sense because the creation itself tells you a great deal about him, but it does not tell you about the redemption he gave at the cross. But the Bible also says, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So there are places in, in regions where missionaries have gone and the people groups have said, we knew he's there, but we didn't know. Thank you for bringing this message to us. You see, because those who receive the light that God gives, he gives more light. And here in the first chapter of Romans, listen carefully. In fact, if you would open your Bible, I'm reading from the New International Translation. I'm going to ask you to um, bow your head. And first, before my wife and I read scripture together, we just like to pray about it. This is from Psalm 119, verse 18. Oh God, please open our minds, open our hearts to see the wonderful truths in your word and give us wisdom to understand and to apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, Loyal, I forgot to look when I got up here. What's the time frame? Okay, thank you. Starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Notice this. It's very important. You see, God's judgment and his wrath is not because people don't have the truth. It is because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Do you realize that Jesus, before this was written down, before Jesus, this, Jesus already made this clear. The best known verse in the Bible for many, many years has been John 3.16. For God so loved the world. This is what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. But three verses later, Jesus also nailed this truth when he said, but men love righteousness, that men love darkness, rather than righteousness because their deeds are evil. You see, that's the, that's the real thing. The judgment is because men love darkness rather than light. And that's what Paul is bringing out here in this passage. He says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They're without excuse because they know, but they reject it. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. The uh, Russian philosoph philosopher Dostoevsky said, if there were no God, anything would be permissible. Do you see the evidence of his statement 
in what's going on in our country, when we have those who are undermining the foundations of our country are based upon word, the word of God. But those who want to take down our national motto, in God we trust, or um, one nation under God, they are those who have rejected truth and they want to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And so they are not simply agnostic in that they don't know. They are god haters and so when we see this happening that anything is permissible then you know that's from the perspective of those who want to leave God out of their viewpoint we know God exists because of reason and Sir Isaac Newton made this statement this universe exists and by that one impossible fact, declares itself a miracle. Now, my relatives, in fact, on my dad's side, my dad, my older brother, all of his uncles, all, all my uncles, all my, his brothers, were um, rejectors of the Bible. They were evol evolutionists, and they were um, prone to say, make statements like this. Well, we just believe the facts. We don't believe miracles. Oh, really? Think about that. I mean, I don't have enough faith to be an evolutionist, but I was taught it from the time I was a small boy. And you see, I didn't remain an atheist very long. And I'm so thankful that God jolted me out of, of that atheistic statement. But I was only 11 or 12 when I made the statement, I don't believe in God. I've never seen him. Now, the fact that I'd never seen him, does that mean God doesn't exist? Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen an atom? An electron? Do you believe they exist? I think the atomic theory has been very well established, but have you ever seen electricity? We own the lighting company. I've been a bivocational missionary for a lot of years. We own the lighting company. I have a great deal of respect for electricity, but I didn't work on it. I, we hired electricians. They know how it works, but not even the electricians can define what it is. Can you see electricity? If there's a bare wire hanging from the ceiling, can you look at that wire and tell me if it has electricity in it? Now, I'll tell you what. I, I don't recommend you do this, but you could put up a metal ladder, climb up there and touch me. You'd find out in a hurry. You see, there are some things we can't see, but we can definitely feel it. <laughs> so there are things that are unseen that are real. And... Many of those who rejected God, they, they knew in their hearts. Sergei Golovin knew before he ever was converted that materialism can't answer all of those questions. But anyway, the universe exists, and by that impossible fact, it declares itself a miracle. And the, uh, the um, unbeliever, the atheist, evolutionist who says, I don't believe in miracles. Oh, really? In the beginning, there was nothing. And then it condensed to a tiny dot. It exploded and became everything with no plan, no purpose, no design, and no designer. And you don't believe in miracles? That's believing millions of miracles right there about everything that does exist. So here we find that the creation all around us is reasonable because... There is intricacy in all of creation, whether you're looking into astrophysics with the vastness of the universe around us, like we were singing about, or if you go into microbiology in the minute details of a tiny cell, it's all design. Can you name for me an inventor, I mean an invention that doesn't have an inventor? Reason says for every invention there has to be an inventor. Every effect must have an adequate cause. Now, maybe you've heard somebody bring up the question, well, who created God? That's really the question of a small child. But there are adults who use that question. Who created God? You know, the problem is 
the one asking the question doesn't realize who God is. It's the definition of God who needs to, that needs to be clarified because if someone created God, that one that was, God can't be created. Someone created God. He wasn't God in the first place because God is the eternal, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing first cause of everything else. And you cannot cause a first cause. There has to be a first cause for everything else. He is the eternal one, and he has planted eternity in our hearts. And so we, when we know who God is, we know that the reason of his creation points to him. And there is also the very fact that he created us in his image with the ability to think, with the ability to reason. The very fact that you can ask the question is evidence that he has given you the ability to reason. Have you ever heard of a herd, a group, whatever you call a, a group of chimpanzees sitting around in a circle talking about philosophy, trying to figure out where did we come from, where are we going, and what happens after we die? The animals don't think about those things. Animals don't have the ability to reason. And if we're 98% the same as chimpanzees, where are the chimpanzees that are uh, studying astrophysics, sending people to the moon, or doing musical concerts, or writing novels? All of this that put, God put in the capacity of human beings does not fit with animals. Besides the further research about the DNA, it's been a lie for years, 20 years or more, that the DNA of human beings and chimpanzees is 98 to 99 percent the same and the evolutionists were fudging because they only checked the features between chimpanzees and human beings that are similar and there's a much more logical reason as to why there are similarities than the idea because we had a common ancestor this is what the evolutionists push all the time that the similarities mean we had a common ancestor it's much more logical that we had a common creator. You see, but by their materialism, they have already ruled God out of the equation. Resurrection. Reason, resurrection, relationship. I can't help believe, but believe in God because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't any better proven fact of all ancient history. Did you know that? The resurrection has been verified over and over again by witnesses, eyewitnesses who are willing to lay down their lives. There are multiple reasons why you can believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. And some of the theories that the unbelievers have come up with are more far-fetched to try to believe than the fact that the tomb was empty after he arose. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ has none of the qualities of a myth. Now, if you hear somebody who starts out once upon a time in a faraway place, what do you know? It's a myth. It's a make-believe story. Or long, long ago on a galaxy far away, anything like that, it's a myth. But have you taken note that we have the records of eyewitnesses, apostles, and companions of the apostles, those that the Holy Spirit designed to give us the record, who told us what happened, and just 40 days after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, after he had appeared to his apostles and others many, many times, he commanded them to go back into the same city where they crucified him, and on the next great feast day when thousands would be there, then was when they were to make the announcement that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I would like for you to turn with me to Acts, the second chapter, and hear what Peter told them on this day. I mean, who better to preach the, the uh, resurrection sermon on the day of Pentecost 
than one who was just as guilty as Judas. Peter also betrayed Jesus, denied that he even knew him. And you know the difference between Judas and Peter? Judas wanted to make his own way. Judas tried to solve the problem himself. In other words, work salvation. He had remorse. He didn't have true repentance, and he went out and hung himself to try to resolve the problem when he came under conviction. He didn't turn it over to the Lord. But the Lord Jesus restored Peter, gave him, he, Peter deeply and truly repented, and accepted the grace of God. Who better to, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, than the apostle Peter who had denied that he even knew him, and then on the day of Pentecost preached these words. Verse 22 and following of Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death whom God raised, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he could be held by it. Why was it not possible? This is the creator of all, the one who spoke it into existence. So he came, he took a human body in order to have blood to shed for paying for our sins. But it was not possible for him to be held by death. He broke the bonds of death. And here Peter brings us out. By the way, did you notice something else? I mean, theological debates have gone on for centuries over the sovereign will of God and the free will of man and the responsibility of man. Peter preached both in the same verse of scripture and didn't stop to try to explain it. He just declared both of these are parallel truths and 3,000 people repented. So maybe we ought to quit wasting time debating all of this and just get out there and preach the message. Listen, you know, look again here. Verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. That's God's sovereignty. And then the next phrase he says... You have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death. God is sovereign. He organized this, but you did it, and you're responsible. You see? Sovereign will of God, free will of man, right here, together in the same verse. Both are true, parallel truths. And the people repented. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, well, I could give you a number of reasons, but, you know, we could have week-long seminar on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But just think of this. If you're talking to somebody who is a skeptic and wants to just brush it aside, you know, well, nobody comes back from the dead. It's impossible. Ask them, would you please explain to me the um, conversion of Saul of Tarsus? Think about this. Who is the most influential person in all of history? Come on, these are not just rhetorical questions you can answer. Oh, Jesus, yeah. Even H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells was an evolutionist and a historian, but he had the honesty to say, no question about it, Jesus Christ was the most influential person in all of history. Well, who's the second most influential? The Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul wrote more than any other apostle, and there's more in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul than any other of the apostles, and he became the missionary to the Gentiles, but was also a missionary to his own Jewish people, and so the Apostle Paul, the one who became the fervent evangelist, was he was the persecutor Saul before he became the persuader Paul. How was he converted? Come on. What's that? Jesus appeared to him in his resurrected form and called him to be an apostle. And that's what turned him around. 
If he did not see the resurrected Lord Jesus explain his conversion, he had prestige and power. And he gave that up for being persecuted and beaten and thrown out of city after city. Why? Because he knew this is the truth. That's why. You cannot explain the conversion of Saul of Tarsus historically and the fact that he is a historical character, both Jesus and Paul, historically cannot be denied. But ask them to explain it. There's one other thing about the resurrection I want to mention, and that is this. We know that the Jewish leaders hated Jesus even though he fulfilled the prophecies, they chose which prophecies they wanted to believe and which ones they wanted to ignore. Does that go on today? Anyway, we know that they orchestrated for Jesus to be crucified by the Romans, and they did not want this story of the resurrection of Jesus to get out. They tried to suppress it. You see, they did what they thought they had to do, because if you reject the truth, then you got to try to cover up the, the truth. And so they had this make-believe story that his disciples came and stole the body. So by that very story, they were admitting that the tomb was empty, right? You see, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then explain why the very enemies of Jesus who orchestrated his crucifixion did not expose it and stop it before it ever got out of Jerusalem. You see, they didn't want this story to go on. They commanded the apostles no longer to preach in the name of Jesus. But there's something that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, those leaders could have done. They had the, the political clout to force Pilate to crucify an innocent man. Pilate knew he was not guilty, but because they were threatening Pilate with turning him over to Caesar, they, he crucified an innocent man. And they knew exactly where his tomb was. All those leaders would have had to do when the apostles started preaching that Jesus is risen would have been to say, gather down by the tomb. They could have pressured Pilate to break that seal roll back the stone, produce the dead body, and it would have stopped it right then and there. The gospel message would have never gone out of Jerusalem if the tomb were not empty. But the tomb was empty and they could not stop it because these who had seen and heard him in his resurrection were unstoppable. They weren't afraid of death. They knew Jesus had told them, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. And they took it. And they continued to proclaim the message. That's the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the keynote to the whole gospel. And by the way, a number of years ago when I was witnessing on campus, I noticed that the ones that I was witnessing to on campus, we could spend hours and hours debating about creation and evolution. And I switched to say, how do you explain the resurrection of Christ? And I started sharing with them some evidences that Christ arose. They had no answer. You see, they, they've got all kinds of excuses for why they believe evolution. But once they acknowledge that Jesus, they couldn't answer the questions about the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a good place to start. And then show them the fraud they've believed concerning evolutionism. So um, we'll go into that some more. But the third reason. So reason Resurrection, relationship. And this is where I'll give you my um, personal testimony. I'll have to condense it. But here's the thing. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some things have to be experienced to be realized personally. I have tasted and I know he is good. And Jesus said, it's in John 7, 17. If you will to do his will, you shall know the teaching. Whether I speak on my own or whether I speak from God. If you are willing to do his will, you'll know. Years ago, when I was ministering in Eugene, Oregon, there was a young preacher there, brilliant guy, but he had written a, a leaflet 
and he called it Why I Assume God Exists. And I remember thinking about that title. Is that the best we can do? There are all kinds of assumptions. Evolutionists have bucket loads of assumptions, but we can only assume that God exists. Well, here's the thing. If you simply look to Acts, the first chapter, it says that Jesus appeared to his apostles after his resurrection and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And we know only God can raise the dead. Can we know? Over and over again in the scripture, it says that God can be known, that the truth can be known. Are there absolute truths? Absolutely. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is risen, that he has, re uh, he has redeemed me, he has given me a purpose and a goal, a meaning in life, and he didn't let me sit soak and sour in my atheism because it wasn't very long after I had declared myself an atheist that my dad was in a terrible accident. Now, now my dad, to my knowledge, never ever acknowledged that it was God who saved him from death in that accident. But my dad was a carpenter, contractor, and um, I grew up in Longmont, Colorado, and dad was working on an old building. My granddad had bought an old building, and he wanted the the lumber from the building and my dad borrowed my uncle's tractor and my brother-in-law was working with my dad. It was in the winter time, it was in January 1956 and it was out in the country. Nobody had cell phones back then and I don't know why but the guard was not over the power takeoff on that tractor and when they, they were pulling the walls down, my brother-in-law was down in the basement and when dad was climbing up onto that tractor and he was wearing heavy clothes and he, his pant leg caught in the power takeoff and it pulled him in there. My brother-in-law heard him scream, but by the time he ran up there and shut the tractor off, dad was laying down underneath the tractor. It took all of the flesh from his ankle and his foot clear to the bone, but even worse, when he was trying to get his pant leg out, it caught in his jacket and it ripped his arm out, completely out of socket from the shoulder and the ligaments were stretched, the blood was going everywhere. My brother-in-law, Bob, jumped into the pickup truck, drove to a neighboring farm, called the ambulance. It was at least an hour by the time they got him to the hospital. And my family didn't tell me at first what really happened. They did tell me my dad was in an accident and his arm was broken. While well, I was a 12-year-old boy, I had seen some other kids. I'd never had a broken arm, but I'd seen some kids come to school with an arm and a sling, and six or eight weeks later, they were fine. I didn't realize how serious it was. But what I did notice that there were people coming and going to our house. And uh, in the evening, when I was right around a corner where they couldn't see me, two of my relatives were whispering kind of loud. And all of a sudden, I, when I overheard their whisper, I understood, my dad's dying. They didn't expect he'd be alive by the next morning. And I had already declared myself to be an atheist. But down inside, I knew he was there. And there was no place else to turn. And it was my first fervent prayer. Now, my mom had sent me to Sunday school classes. I'd had good seed planted in me. I'd been in Bible school classes. I had been to vacation Bible school, even youth meetings uh, and and, and uh, Christian camp. But in that desperate moment was when I turned to him. And I'd bowed my head before when others were praying. But this time it was from my heart. Oh God, please spare my dad. And the next morning he was still alive. And the next morning after that. And the next morning after that. And this went on for weeks. And when the doctor released him from the hospital... He said to my mom, Mrs. Dayton, I have no explanation for your husband's recovery. And the more I think about this, the more I realize, <laughs> how could he have an explanation? You see, a few years ago, our son was in a, an accident where he was on his four-wheeler and hit a washed-out washed out gully, went over the handlebars, 
and it ripped him open, but the doctor told us it was about half an inch from the main artery that went all the way down his leg. He says, if it had ripped that main artery open, he'd have bled to death right there in a few minutes. I started thinking back on my dad's accident. Now, how much closer can you get to the heart than having your left arm ripped right out of the socket? And so it was already a miracle that my dad didn't bleed to death right out there before they ever got him to a hospital and before I even knew about it and prayed. But what did come through to me is God is there. He's real. And he heard my first prayer. And so I heard my mom on the phone. She loved talking on the phone. And she, I don't know if she even paid attention. I was over there listening. But she told this over and over again, how the doctor had no explanation for her husband's recovery. My dad lived over 30 years more. Over 30 years after that. And went back to work six months later and I started working with him. He was a carpenter contractor. By the way, he taught me the meaning of hard work. But anyway, there's a lot that my dad, he was an honorable man in many ways. But he chose the Judas path. I need to do it myself. He was a man of grit and a man of integrity about his word. But a few years later, after I gave my life to Christ, and by the way, it was April 22nd, so the accident was in January. And by the way, my mom had been sending me to Bible school, and she didn't send me anymore. You know why? She didn't need to, because God got my attention. When he answered my prayer for my dad, he was drawing me to himself. He didn't let me sit and sour in that atheist viewpoint. So I was going on my own. I wanted, you see, he put, a, he, he put a desire in me to know this God who loved me even though I was a foul-mouthed kid that denied I even knew him, denied that he even existed. And so I was going, I was listening, I was hearing. Not only was I going to, vac going to the Bible school classes, I was staying for the sermons, and I was, we had a powerful preacher who was preaching the Word of God, and on the 22nd of April, I stepped out. I, I had already talked to our pastor about this. I confessed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the, the day that I was baptized. And it was one of the few times I saw my dad in church. And my Uncle Ray on my mom's side, he was there with me. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I accept him as my Lord, my Master. Greatest decision that I ever made. And there's a whole lot more to the story, but years later, I wrote this down for a communion service. Dear Jesus, I appreciate you because you took me as a lonely, confused, frustrated, heartsick, sinful kid, saved me by your precious blood, and gave me a purpose in life. All that I am, all that I have accomplished, all I ever will accomplish, I owe it all to you. I collect atheist stories. Maybe you can understand why. And I know a few atheist stories about what happens when it comes to death. You've probably heard of Voltaire, famous French atheist. There was one young lady, a servant, who cared for him during his illness and his death. And afterwards she said, I would not witness the death of another atheist for all the gold in Europe. So terrible was that experience to her. At the time Brezhnev died, he was probably the most prominent, athe prominent atheist in the world. I didn't see this. Um, but Philip Yancey talked to some of the people who were there who did witness this. At Brezhnev's funeral, as they were closing the service, his wife went over to the casket. She leaned over and kissed him that final goodbye kiss, and she put the sign of the cross on Brezhnev's chest. Why? It was her grasping at hope. You can, because the cross is the universal symbol of Christianity. 
And atheism is a hopeless philosophy. It has nothing to offer. Nothing in this life, nothing in the future. And she was grasping for a whisper of hope. I hope she did turn to Jesus. I don't know beyond that. But I do know this was something that they witnessed. But my conversion story convinces me God is alive and well. The gospel is true. Jesus is our resurrected Lord. What then will you do with Jesus? I'll turn it back to you, Loyal. By the way, isn't it great to have a pastor who's always loyal? <laughs> Stand with me, would you? Maybe you, uh, the Lord spoke to you this morning and uh, you want to respond. If you do, uh, the man's coming. We're going to take just a few minutes just to, to pray and uh, give you time if you need to. If you need to make some kind of decision, maybe you've, you've just been pushed over the line today. Maybe you've decided, yeah, you, you really do want to follow Jesus. So we have uh, deacons and elders. We've got Brother Rick's here. I'll be here. Um, pray if you need to. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and uh, thank you for the, the word shared this morning. The encouragement, the challenge to share what we know, what we have. Lord, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that uh, there is reason. There is the resurrection. And we can have a relationship with you. And we thank you for that this morning in Jesus' name. Thy works shall praise thy name. Sing it with us. 